Southern Illinois University in agricultural economics. He worked for CGB, which is a grain supplier. Think Berman Industries here. And he worked for them for 34 and a half years, and he retired in 2017 as a senior vice president. He and Lynn, his wife, moved to Cookie County in January of 1988. They purchased a home and lived in New Harmony part-time beginning in 2011 and moved to town permanently in March of 21. Since, Rod, uh, since 2019, Rod has been the chairperson of the New Harmony and Wabash River Bridge Authority. He's a longtime board member of Cookie County United Way, and he served as the interim director between 1999 and 2000. Additionally, in 21, he served as a chairperson for Coast Fest, and he and his wife, Lynn, own a successful business here in town called Lowry Hollow. So now let's talk about booze. <laughs> <laughs> so how about Rod and his whiskey connection? Well, here we go. His love of whiskey caused him to form Rod Clark's Whiskey Adventure in 2017. He graduated, and you can't make this up, from the Moonshine University in Louisville, <laughs> where master distillers from all across the country go to learn uh, the craft of, of distillation and all things whiskey. He's traveled extensively across Scotland, Scotland's bourbon tasting country, visiting distilleries. And when I called him and said, hey, Rod, I'm going to be introducing you, would you send me some stuff? And he said, begrudgingly, he said, well, yeah, I'll send you some stuff, but you can just say, and here's Rod. So, <laughs> here's Rod. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, this is a great crowd. Uh, I have to ask you all, was it the word whiskey or was it Rod Clark? <laughs> you all. I'm guessing it's probably whiskey. Uh, uh, it's an interesting topic. Um, and before uh, we talk a little bit about whiskey, uh, let me just make uh, some personal comments. Uh, you know, what a special town we live in that has a special place like this. Uh, you know, the scaffolding's gone. Is this place a gym or not? I mean, it's, it's beautiful what they did to the roof and to, uh, to the board, to the friends, and to the board here at the library. Uh, thank you for your contribution to our town. Well, uh, I don't know why we're talking about whiskey at the library, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, w, uh, the WMI's founding uh, was on the principle of the dissimulation of useful knowledge. Hopefully, <laughs> this will be some useful knowledge to you, okay? Uh, uh, the topic is the world of whiskey, and we're going to talk about the world of whiskey. We're going to talk about all the different kinds of whiskey that you've heard about. But before we do that, we kind of need to talk a little bit about what whiskey is. Uh, I get asked all the time, well, you know, it's not bourbon, so it's not whiskey, right? There's a lot of confusion. So kind of the first half of my presentation, we're just going to kind of walk through uh, what whiskey is, what it's not. We're going to compare it to some other distilled spirits and talk about uh, what the differences are. Uh, then once we get through that and you get a little bit of an understanding uh, about whiskey and what it is, then we're going to talk about these different categories around the world. For example, Scotch, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey. I mean, you've heard these uh, through the years. So that's how we'll finish off is talking about all those different around the world whiskeys and what makes them uh, peculiar, what makes them different for each category. Okay, we ready to go? Yeah. All right. Uh, this is not my computer. Here we go. Okay, in order to talk about whiskey, I'm going to talk. I'm going to start at the very top. Okay, we're going to talk really big, and then we're just going to keep getting down the funnel to where we end up talking about whiskey, and then we'll get even more specific and talk about the different kinds of whiskey. Okay. So first and foremost, whiskey is a distilled spirit. Okay, it is a distilled spirit. Well, what is a distilled spirit? A distilled spirit is where you take fermented liquids, okay? You take fermented liquids that are heated to create a vapor, 
then you cool them, reduce them to a vapor, and that vapor then turns back to a liquid whenever you cool it down, okay? Since alcohol is lighter than water, uh, the alcohol vapors come off first. Okay, so let's talk about something to get your arms around, okay? Distilled water, okay? What is distilled water? Distilled water is basically water that's been heated until it turns to a vapor. You can do this on your stove at home, right? You boil water, what happens when you boil water? It turns to a vapor, right? It turns to a vapor. If you could capture that, and when they make distilled water, they do, they capture those vapors, they cool them back down, it turns back into a liquid because you've cooled it back down, and that's distilled water. Okay? Just that simple. You take a liquid, you heat it, then you cool it back down, uh, you take the vapor back down to, uh, to a liquid. Okay? A distilled spirit, instead of starting with water, starts with a fermented liquid. Okay? Well, what's a fermented liquid? Let's talk about what a fermented liquid is. A fermented liquid is very simple how they're made. You start with the carbohydrate, you take the carbohydrate, you add yeast, you add water, and the last component is you have time. Okay? You all undoubtedly have had things ferment on your kitchen counter. Okay? It's real easy to do. You take any carbohydrate, and when you put yeast in a carbohydrate and water, that yeast begins to do what? Makes it bubble, right? You're basically turning it into a fermented liquid. I'll give you an example. I have a buddy. Uh, Phil Ferguson, some of you may know him. He had a friend that brought him, uh, he had a friend that brought him some maple syrup. Okay, it was in a mason jar. So it was in a maple syrup, he brought it in a mason jar, put it on his counter and out in his shed. Phil leaves and goes on vacation, he comes back vacation, what happened? That mason jar had exploded all over his workshop. So he's got maple syrup all over the place. Well, why did that happen? Because that maple syrup fermented, right? We all know that there's free yeast in the air, okay? So whenever he brought it to him, there must have been some yeast that got in it. When he capped it tight, it fermented, it turned to a vapor, didn't have any place to go, and it exploded, okay? So that's how you make a fermented liquid. So a distilled spirit starts with a fermented liquid, one of those fermented liquids that's then heated to create a vapor and, and it cool back down. Yeah. Okay? So, whiskey is a distilled spirit. It starts with a fermented liquid. We're going to talk about what that fermented liquid is in just a second. Okay? Before we do that, however, I talked about how whenever you heat it up, then uh, the vapors rise, right? And remember we said alcohol is lighter than water, so the alcohol vapors come up first. Whenever you heat that fermented liquid, you're not taking it to 220 degrees, because if you do, you're boiling the water now, right? And you're getting all the water in your vapor. You don't want to do that. You're just trying to take the alcohol, right? So alcohol is lighter than water, so around 180 degrees, these vapors start to come off. You're, in, you're distilling at that point. Well, how do they do that commercially? Okay, well, you do it in a still. All right, just that simple. There are basically two kinds of stills. There are pot stills and there are column stills. Let me describe a little bit of what you're looking at. These two stills are at a distillery in, uh, in Scotland uh, at a uh, distillery called Glen Parkless. I don't know if you've heard of Glen Parkless or not. Glen Parkless is kind of famous in Scotland because it's the last remaining family owned distillery. All the other distilleries have all been bought off by the big alcohol conglomerates like Diageo and uh, uh, Bacardi and all those guys. This is the last one left, okay? So what they've done is they've taken a fermented liquid, which we'll get to in just a second of what that is, okay? They put that fermented liquid in here. There's heat underneath this, and, uh, and that gets hot, and as the alcohol vapors start to warm up, they go up the top of this, of this still, okay? As they rise, 
and get away from the heat, they're going to cool, right? So they condensate on the sides of the still. They run back down until they come back up again, okay? So in, what you're doing is, as they naturally rise, they're going to cool, they drop down again, and it just keeps getting distilled. Eventually, it gets to the point to where those vapors are light enough that they come all the way to the top, and when they get to the top, then they start to fall down this shank, okay? I forget the technical term. I'm sure I should know that. Uh, but they drop down, and then it goes through the process where they get cooled back down, and they turn those vapors back into to liquid again, okay? That's a pot still, okay? You do it one batch at a time, okay? You do one batch, and in Scotland, or anybody that uses a pot still, you usually have to distill twice. When you distill here, you're usually going to come off with about, mm, by the time you're done, about 60% alcohol. The stuff that comes off first is higher alcohol, but by the time you're done, you're stripping out. you got a lot of water in it and everything else. So they distill it again uh, in the second pot still, and that's how they make, uh, that's how they make uh, their scotch at Glen Barkles. Okay? Now, the other way that you can do it is with a column still. Okay? If you want to see a column still, we're real lucky around here. There's one 13 miles away. Drive down to Mount Vernon. There's an ethanol plant there. What do you think they're making when they make ethanol? They're making alcohol. That's all they're doing. It's the exact same thing, okay? When this was invented, this like revolutionized the whiskey industry. This happened back in the 1920s, 1930s, I think. It was a man named Coffee. interesting name, his name was Coffee, and it was called a coffee still. So if you ever see a whiskey bottle that says they use coffee stills, well, they're trying to schmooze you a little bit to make you think it's something special. It's just a coffee, it's just a, a column still, okay? Uh, so what happens in this big thing, this thing's probably 30, 40, maybe in some of the really big places, uh, maybe 50 feet tall, what happens is it's getting heated at the bottom, and then there are plates in here at each one of these. It's like a mesh plate, so when those vapors come up, it hits that plate, right? What happens? It condensates. You know, if you, if you took a, a, a wire mesh and put it over a boiling water, well, you, it's going to drip back down, right? So every time it hits one of these, it drips back down and keeps going again. The big difference between these two are... First of all, you'll notice the, the similarity is they're both copper, okay? That, they don't have to be, but copper lends a lot of sulfur taste, and it, it, you want to use copper because that gives the whiskey flavor, okay? In this one, you're making one batch, you're done, you stop, you clean it out, you steam it out, you got to start all over again, okay? A column still runs continuously. It never stops. It's an industrial application. It runs 24 hours a day. You go to the ethanol plant down in Mount Vernon, it's running 24 hours a day. You go to Wild Turkey Distillery, column still, running 24 hours a day. Okay? There's a heck of a lot less romance about this <coughs> than this. Okay? Now, enough said or I'll start to show my bias on my whiskey choices. <laughs> any, any quick questions? And, and honest, we can ask questions as we go along. Any quick questions about distillation and how those work? Difference in the taste between the two? That's like looking at a piece of art and saying, do you think that's a beautiful piece of art? Uh, I, they will give you different flavored whiskeys. If you start it, let me hold that question as we go along because we're going to talk about where the flavor of whiskey comes from. And then I'll come back to it. Okay? Any other questions about distillation and how it works? How long yes. does it take? Chuck. Is the ethanol plant down in Mount Vernon copper or stainless? Uh, they're probably stainless. Yeah, yeah they don't care what it tastes <laughs> like. They're just going in your gas tank, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're stainless. <laughs> Somebody had something over here? How long did it take? Uh, well, this one's continuous. It's running all the time. It's, it's coming in the bottom and it's going out the top. Uh, probably 
three to four hours. I mean, I'll look at a Lynn because I've drug her through, through so many distilleries <laughs> in Scotland. I, you know, three to four hours. Uh, if, if you visit a distillery in Scotland, they're going to get very romantic about this and talk about how the distillery master makes his cuts at a certain time and all of that. Uh, look, it's industrialized as well. They're making their cuts. They're stopping whenever it reaches a certain level of alcohol that's coming off. Uh, I'm, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing it takes about a half a day to run it through this and a half a day to run it through that. So you take a full day to do that batch. Now you're going to ask me how many gallons those are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It depends on how they still. <laughs> okay, any other questions about stills? How Bill? How do you pull the methanol off of a pot still? Uh, it, it comes off the top. Uh, it, it's coming up. And when it comes off, it, how do they pull the ethanol off? No, methanol. Usually that's first. The heads and tails. The heads and tails. There is the, there, that is in, it's, it, it's, it's industrialized, okay? There's a thing called the whiskey safe. And if the first runs will come off, and whenever it reaches a certain temperature, when the still reaches a certain temperature, okay, let me get a little more specific of those questions. Whenever you start to heat it up, there are certain alcohols that come off at different layers of heat, okay? So when you get it to like 110 degrees, the very first alcohol that comes off is methanol. That's the stuff that makes you blind. <laughs> I mean, you've heard people about home distilling, and that'll make you blind. Okay, yeah. it's the methanol. Probably. Okay, so as long as you don't put that stuff in your whiskey, you're fine. You just have to know that don't include that. They're pulling that stuff off on the first cuts, and then there's actually levels that the alcohol goes through. I actually have a, a kit at home where you can smell the different alcohol, so you'll know where, what level, as the heat rises, you're going through these different levels. One of which is acetone. Ladies, your fictional yeah. nail polish remover. I mean, when you smell it come off, it's like, this is fingernail polish. It's because your temperature is right there where that's what's coming off, okay? There's, there's another level that smell. I swear to God, smells exactly like a wet dog. <laughs> and in the distilling business, it's, we're at the wet dog phase, okay? And when you're running it off on these things, they know where those temperatures are at, and so the computer tells them, okay, we're at 130 degrees, let's make the cut. Then you got the, the, the hearts, and then, and then it gets nasty on the tail end again, too. That, just to keep it, just to keep it simple. The wet dog phase, interestingly enough, you want a little bit of that stuff because that gives the whiskey flavor. If you just do that pure cut right in the middle, there's not a whole lot of flavor going on. So the art is to get just enough of this stuff down here on this end and just enough of this stuff in the, in the, the pure stuff to make it taste good. Susie. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's too big and it's too expensive. Uh, none, none of the whiskey you're buying in a bottle in the store is homemade. That's, the homemade stuff is where there's, people don't know their art. Like, like buying a painting from somebody it was their first day painting. Probably not going to be very good. Is that where the term hair of the dog Let me, uh, let me go back here just a second. Okay, so remember, we're talking about distilled spirits. We're not talking about whiskey yet. We're talking about how do you make a distilled spirit. You start with a fermented liquid, okay? And a fermented liquid is made of four things. A carbohydrate, yeast, water, and time. Got a lot of set and bone to ferment, right? Okay. All right, so let's talk about what those carbohydrates are, okay? Because this is real important. Now we're going to start to talk a little bit about what whiskey is not, okay? So what is the carbohydrate that you might use to make a distilled spirit? 
Number one, what's the simplest carbohydrate bread you know of? Sugar. I mean, we got any nutritionists or dietitians in the room? It's sugar, right? It's like mainline. Okay? It's real simple to make alcohol out of sugar. Okay? If you, if that is your carbohydrate source for your fermented liquid that you're making your distilled spirit of, that distilled spirit is called rum. Okay? So if you're making it out of pure sugar, it's rum. Okay, now as we go through these, one thing that should come kind of apparent to you fairly quickly is, is you make whiskey, or I'm sorry, you make your distilled spirits with what you've got. Okay, traditionally. Okay, so what do you think they got a lot of in the Caribbean? Sugar cane, rum, right? I mean, you know, it's growing wild down there. Okay, they're not growing a whole lot of corn in Bermuda. So they're not making their distilled spirits out of grain. They're making it out of sugar. Okay, now, there are lots of different kinds of sugar. And I didn't know this until I went to uh, Moonshine University. <laughs> and we had we had a whole we had a whole half day that was just on rum, and they had all the different kinds of sugars and everything. Uh, and you can make it out of all the different kinds of sugars. You you can go home tonight, put some sugar, refined sugar, in a bowl, put water in it, put some yeast in it, stir it up, give it some time. It's going to ferment. You wake up in the morning and it'll be bubbling, right? Okay. So you can make it out of granulated refined sugar. Uh, more often than not, a lot of people are making it out of molasses or a molasses blend, okay? If you get into some other uh, uh, areas, uh, they, there's a thing called panela, which is basically unrefined cane sugar. In other words, they strip it right out of the stalk. That's panela. It hasn't been touched. It's, they're stripping it right out of the stalk. Uh, jaggery. Or anybody heard the term gur? Anybody like Indian food? Okay, Indian food a lot of times calls for gur. Okay, gur is basically unrefined cane sugar, and a lot of times they'll put palm ingredients and stuff in it. It gets really, really hard. It's like a, it's like a, yeah, you, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you can break it. I mean, you got to break it up to use it. Okay, uh, or you can make it out of plain syrups. Uh, cane, cane syrup, uh, maple syrup. The reason my buddy had the maple syrup on his counter is because they were going to make some rum out of it. Okay, so you can make, and they did it, and I helped a little bit, and it tasted really good. <laughs> Having a little maple taste to it was kind of interesting. So if your carbohydrate source is sugar or sugar based, you're making rum. Okay, so whiskey's not rum. They're both distilled spirits, but they're different. They're two different distilled spirits. Okay. All right, let's talk about another carbohydrate source that you probably heard of. Okay? If your carbohydrate source is a fruit, okay, you're making brandy. Okay? Brandy is a, it's not wine. Okay? What do you make in a fruit if you let it ferment? You're making wine. Okay? Wine is basically a fermented liquid, but it's not distilled. If you take wine and distill it, you end up, uh, you end up making brandy. Okay? I throw up here a cognac because cognac is just a particular kind of brandy. Okay? You know how the French are. <laughs> if it's from this particular area and you use this particular grape, then it can be called cognac. If not, you know, they're very territorial about how they do their wines. Okay? And it's the same way with their brandies. Okay? It has to be from a particular area. The grapes have to be grown in this particular area, yada yada, to be called cognac. And cognac's good. I like cognac. But uh, if you're looking toward an alternative to a whiskey, Rum or brandy might be an alternative. Alcohol is about the same amount, but it tastes really different. Okay. So if you're making, if your uh, if your fermented liquid is wine and you distill it, you're making brandy or cognac. What else are you thinking? What's another distilled spirit you might like to drink? 
Whoop, sorry. Okay, how about tequila? Anybody like tequila? Okay. Tequila, the carbohydrate source, is uh, a guava. Okay. Now I got to get specific with you. Let me let me let me uh, let me straighten some things out for you. If you make uh, a, if your distilled spirit, the carbohydrate source starts with a guave, it's mezcal. Okay, it's mezcal. You probably have heard of that or seen it. Okay, that is the broad category. If it's made from a specific kind of a guave then it's tequila, okay? So the broad category in tequila is, it's mezcal. Tequila is mezcal, there's no difference. They are mezcal, okay? But if it's made from the blue aguave plant, a specific kind of aguave, then it's tequila. They can label it as tequila. There is a whole heck of a lot of marketing going on with alcohol. So when they're making a big deal on their label about, we only make it from blue uh, aguave, well, if you're making tequila, <laughs> it's no big deal. It's, it's tequila, it's made out of blue aguave. But uh, tequila is a category of, the larger category called mezcal. Okay. Whoops, I'm sorry. Already there. Okay. If your carbohydrate source is a grain, your fermented liquid is going to end up being beer. Okay? When you make beer, you start with grain. Things like malted barley, barley, corn, wheat, okay? Whenever you do that, you're basically making beer. If you take beer, and distill it, if, you're, if, you know, if your fermented liquid is beer and you distill it, you're going to get one of three things. You're either going to get vodka, you're going to get gin, or you're going to get whiskey. So take a good look at this because we're going to leave this screen, but just remember this. If you start with sugar water, you're going to end up with rum. If you start with wine, made from any kind of fruit, but it's basically wine, you're going to end up with brandy. If you're going to start with agave, then you're going to end up with mezcal. And if you start with beer, you're going to end up with one of these three things, one of which will be whiskey. So see how the funnel's starting to get narrowed down. So now that kind of leads us to ask, well, here. All right, so how do we make beer? I'll hit this screen really quick. So how do you make beer? You basically select your mash bill. Okay, mash bill is basically a recipe. In, 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 the, in the alcohol business, your mash bill is, is your recipe. So it means what kind of grains are you putting in it? Okay, you may have corn in it, you may have wheat in it, you may have malted barley, you may have straight barley, whatever your mash bill, and they'll all use different percentages. Like it may be 70% uh, corn, 20% rye and 10% uh, and malted barley. That's your mash bill. And they all start with a mash bill, okay? You basically take whatever those grains are, you grind them up, you do not want to make flour, you want to make kind of like grits or uh, uh, cornmeal, okay? Uh, then you heat water. So you take, you take a big vessel, you start to heat it up, and then there are certain temperature levels where you start to cook your grains, okay? If you're using corn in the recipe, and just about everybody does, why? Because corn is cheap and it's plentiful and it's full of starch, which is easily converted to alcohol, okay? If you, uh, you throw the corn in at about uh, 180, 190 degrees, and then you cook it for an hour or so, because that stuff's got to cook down. Then you turn the heat down, you let it start to cool down, then you're gonna add your rye, your wheat, or your barley, okay? Because it doesn't, it's softer, it doesn't take as long to cook, okay? So, at different temperature levels, you're gonna have, uh, add, add your different grains. Then you let it cool all the way down to 90 degrees, and at 90 degrees, you put the yeast in it. You put the yeast in it, then you let it set. That's how you make it. 
I've never made beer, but I made whiskey, and you start by making beer. Okay. Now, the last step for beer that you're drinking off of the shelf is, well, okay, that's, that stuff's got to get purified and refined a little bit because it's pretty crude stuff. Okay, so it's, it's a crude beer. But they will tell you when you visit distilleries, this is the beer stage. And uh, the mash tune, the mash tune is the vessel that they, uh, that they cook it in and everything. Once they cook it and everything, then they take it over and they transfer it to a vessel called the mash tune, which is where they let it set and ferment for a few days. Usually a couple, two or three days. And if they lift the lid, it smells delicious. <laughs> it really smells good. Then they're going to pull the liquid off, and there's your fermented liquid. Okay, so that's how you make beer. All right. We talked about if you're going to take beer, and you're going to make a distilled spirit. Okay, if, you're, if, you, if you start with beer, you can make whiskey, you can make vodka, you can, uh, or you can make gin. Let's talk about gin and vodka real quick. Okay? They start with the exact same thing. The only difference for gin is whenever the, uh, whenever the vapors are going up the still, there's a valve that they can turn on that makes the vapor go er, right turn, and now you're going to go up this way, and it passes through what's called a gin basket. Okay? A gin basket, by law, by law, to be called gin, that gin basket has to have at least some juniper berries in it. That's what gives gin its classic gin flavor, is the juniper berries. You know whether or not you know it or not, you know what juniper berries look like. You got juniper berries growing in your yard. You ever seen those on an evergreen tree or a pine, you know, not a, not a pine tree, but like shrubbery? If you've got a juniper bush, they put on those little blue, that's a juniper berry. That's what they make gin out of. Okay? Now, by law, by law, there only has to be at least one juniper berry. <laughs> okay? But if you're trying to sell gin and you don't have enough juniper berries in there, people are going to know it doesn't taste like gin. So nobody's going to want to buy your gin, right? So there's always going to be quite a few juniper berries in there. But then there's going to be a basket of a whole bunch of other medicinals, okay? Coriander, clove, uh, it's like a recipe. Uh, and uh, whichever gin guy is making it has his own preferred uh, way of things he puts in the gin basket. So when these vapors are going through, I, I knew you were going to be here tonight. And I'm thinking to myself, Tom Guggenheim's going to be here. The guy's like a PhD chemist, and I want to get up and tell him about the still. <laughs> He's got duct tape. Have I messed it up too bad? I'm trying to dumb it down here. No, you've done pretty good. The only thing that I would add at this point is that each one of these other ingredients are full of hundreds of compounds. Well, that's true. And, you're, and you can't separate them all from the problem. No. So, Tiny amounts can create a taste. Yeah. So these these mixtures are incredibly complex, yeah. and they're full of different compounds. So I never knew about the juniper berries. Yeah, juniper berry. You have to have at least one. Okay, if you buy if you buy a gin if you buy a gin that says London Dry Gin, okay, like Beef Eaters, uh, I think Beef Tangray, uh, it, it'll say London Dry Gin. What that means is it's got a lot of juniper berries in it. I mean, it's an old-fashioned brand, been around forever. It's all about the juniper berries. Now everybody's getting all fancy schmancy and throwing a bunch of other stuff in, trying to make their own unique gin. In the United States, the big trend is, is to make really sweet, fruity gins. So a lot of people, it's an American-made gin. Typically, it's going to have some uh, maybe grapefruit. What do you call that? The rind of Zest. Zest, that's the word of uh, or orange zest, a lot of real fruity stuff, or they have like a cucumber flavor to them, because people got really creative now. Just selling one London right gin doesn't got it anymore, so everybody's trying to come up with their own thing. Okay? But the only difference between... There are other differences. But the main difference between whiskey and vodka and gin is 
Jen goes through this basket of medicinals and that gives it all these flavorings. And as Tom pointed out, uh, it gets really complex. And they, they have chemists that work in their labs that, you know, get these flavonoids and, you know, because they're looking for a particular. Okay, vodka. All right, now, let me just say this right up front. I'm going to piss some of you off. <laughs> Vicki, dear, I know you love vodka. Okay? Here is the definition of vodka. Okay? Vodka is a neutral grain spirit. Okay? It is, okay. Here's the rules. Number one, with vodka, it has to be distilled to above 95% alcohol. Okay? When I took my class, the vodka still was a column still. That thing was about 50 feet tall. Why? Because you can't call it vodka until you've distilled it to 95% alcohol. We're talking Everclear here. Well, we are. It's the same thing. It's, 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 it's the same thing. Difference with vodka is it's been watered down, cooled down, and bottled at something lesser. And you know, But it's, it's the same thing. And it's the same thing that they're making in Mount Vernon. Okay. It's there, there. I mean, yes. Do you work there? I don't. Okay. I'm black. <laughs> you like black? No, I don't. Okay. Actually, yeah, I think black is bad. But um, why do they have some vodkas then that need to be triple distilled okay. sixteen times distilled? Okay. okay. It is total marketing BS. It is total marketing BS, okay? Because remember that column still I showed you? Okay, well, this is a vodka still, okay? All right, count with me. Okay, so every time that that vapor rises up to one of these screens and then falls back down again, that's one distillation, okay? So let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, when they say distill 13 times, there is no way they're running that thing through a still 13 times. Well, what I they're basically it. saying is they're just counting every time that it drops down and gets distilled again. I figured if it needed to be distilled that many times, it would have been a shit product. <laughs> okay. I want you to read one more thing here, because this is the rules. Number one, it has to be distilled to 95%. If you're taking a fermented liquid and distilling it to 95% alcohol, there's no flavor. I mean, it, whatever unique character you have from the grain that you use, there, it's 95% it's alcohol. You can't, alcohol is tasteless. And you're almost there, okay? And then, read this. Definition. A neutral spirit distilled or treated after distillation with charcoal or other materials so as to be without distinctive character, aroma, taste, or color. By definition, vodka is pure and has no flavor. Okay? Why do we love it? <laughs> That's a serious question. What? Now think about that for a second. Why is vodka the number one selling distilled spirit in the world? It makes a great mixer. You mix it with you mix it with uh, cranberry juice, and it tastes like cranberry juice. You mix it with orange juice, and it tastes like orange juice. It's great for cocktails. Okay, uh, and so that's why we love vodkas because typically we're putting it into uh, a cocktail. Now, some people love uh, martinis. Okay, and and that's. That's cool, but probably what it means is you just like a nice, clean alcohol with no flavor. Now, I'm a, I'm a whiskey guy, okay? So I'm a whiskey snob. So, you know, there would be people that would want to talk to me about, you come to my house and we'll taste different vodkas and they have different flavors. Vodka works quicker than whiskey. The answer to that, Bill, is that's not the case. <laughs> if they are the same alcohol content, they're getting you there in the same way. Jim is okay. Jim is the 
the same as FICA, except it goes through the uh, through the basket, and it does not go to 95% off. No, that would be a waste of energy. There's no rules that says it can't be, but they're they're not doing it because you're wasting energy at this point. It takes a lot of energy to make FICA because you got to get it so high. They don't sell FICA at 190 proof. No, they don't. You have to proof it down. No. So you proof it down to something. Right here. And if bottled, it's bottled at not less than 40% volume rate proof. So but can vodka flavor be affected by what it's proofed down with? Because obviously the alcohol doesn't have any flavor, but it's not all alcohol. All alcohol is brought down with mineral water. Hmm. Even whiskey. Mineral water can have a distinctive flavor. If, if you're... Uh, if your if your taste buds are refined enough to pick that up, then I would say yes, that is a true statement. Uh, <laughs> Dosi, and then I'm gonna let you be the authority, Dan. Dosi, hang on. Potatoes was something that, you know, people used to make alcohol out of, and it became a local traditional thing, and they did so. But if it's labeled as vodka, same rules apply here. Okay. Hey. <laughs> 45 minutes in, and we got the whiskey. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about, okay, we've talked about what whiskey is not, okay? we talked about, you start with beer, okay? You're going to distill beer. Okay, well, but you can also make other things out of beer whenever you distill it. Let's talk about what makes whiskey unique. Here's the definition of whiskey. Now, this is the purest definition. It's a distilled spirit that's made from beer, okay, that has passed through a wooden vessel. What makes whiskey whiskey is the fact that it's stored in wood in a barrel. You, the barrel is what gives it its color. You don't see vodka that's brown. It's because it does not pass through a barrel. Okay? Now, the, the key word here is by law, the definition is pass through. Quite literally, you could take your distilled spirit, run it through one side of a barrel and out the other and label it as whiskey. That would be legal. Okay? But we'd sell too much of it because it's going to be pretty crystal clear. But, uh, you know, but uh, that's the definition that we will start of for whiskey. Okay? Now, I'm going to come back to your, I'm going to start to come back to your question you asked about earlier. Any distiller will tell you this. Almost 
And this is the number they use all the time. 65% of the flavor of whiskey comes from the barrel. It's all about the barrel, which means if you want your whiskey to taste like something, probably need to sell it a lot on a barrel because it's pulling all of the tannins and uh, 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 all of the enzymes and everything out of that wood. Okay, and that's what makes it taste like whiskey. Otherwise, it's fine. Except there's other things going on with fire. Okay? So, now, I say 65%. Well, okay, that still leaves us with 35%, right? Okay, well, that other 35% of the flavor probably comes from, well, which grain did you start with? You know, what's your mash bill? Okay, how long did you store it? And, and there's other things that go into it. Uh, but 65% of the flavor comes from the wood. All right, now we're going to get to the world of whiskey. Okay. That's the big term definition for whiskey. The only thing it is, it's got to pass through a barrel. Now we're going to talk about these different kinds of whiskey that you have all heard of before. Okay, we're going to talk about bourbon, what makes bourbon bourbon, what makes scotch scotch, Irish, Canadian, and then I'm going to throw a category in on you, Japanese. We'll talk about that in a second. Traditionally, that's not a real category, but it is now, so we'll talk about it. All right, here's the definition of bourbon. Here are the laws, the rules. These laws, this law was passed in 1964. Number one, it must be made in the USA. This is our whiskey. If you go anywhere else and say, I'll take an American whiskey, they're going to give you a bourbon. Okay? Because it's identified as this is what we make in the U.S. It's bourbon. Now, we don't have to. We can make other stuff. But it's our whiskey. Okay. The mash bill must, by law, be at least 51% corn. Okay? Remember we talked about rum? I said, why do you think they make rum in the Caribbean? So, it traditionally is American whiskey. It, it, it starts with very large uh, corn content. Okay? Thirdly, it must be aged. Okay? And right now, aged is undefined. It can pass through, but it must be aged in a virgin charred oak vessel. 99.9% .9 of the time, a vessel that's a barrel. Okay, so for now on, I'm just going to say a barrel. But that, nothing in the law says it has to be a barrel. It could be a wooden square. But, it, uh, but I'm going to use barrel from now on in. Okay? Virgin means that that barrel has never been used for anything else in its life. It is a brand new barrel. It is newly made out of new oak. Okay? Uh, secondly, it must be charred. What char means is they set that barrel over a fire and they let it set there for about three or four minutes until the inside starts to burn and it's like charcoal. Okay? All barrels used to store liquids uh, that we drink are usually fired in that way. Okay? Because that fire releases a lot of the tannins, there's a chemical process that happens whenever you burn that wood that gives you a lot of flavors you want. Wine barrels, you know, wine stored in barrels too, right? Wine barrels are usually toasted, which means they're brown, kind of caramelized, but not black. Okay? So wine barrels are toasted, whiskey barrel, bourbon barrels are charred. Okay? Uh, now we're going to get into some technical stuff. I'm going to go through this real quick, but you're going to see as we go through the other kinds of whiskey, these change a little bit. Okay? So number one, it cannot exceed 160 proof during the distilling process. By the way, take proof, divide by two, and they give you the alcohol. Okay? So whenever they're distilling it, you can't get it hotter than 160. What was the rule for uh, vodka? It has to go to at least 190. Okay, so in whiskey, in bourbon, they're basically saying, we don't want you to cook the hell out of it because you're taking all the flavor out of it. 
Leave it alone. Can't go any higher than 160. Okay? Uh, it has to be less than 125 proof when it goes in the barrel. Now, in the process, what happens is you've got this big column still, and it's coming off. They're pulling it off somewhere between here and here. <laughs> okay? So it's going straight into the barrel uh, between 125, uh, I'm sorry, less than 125. Cannot go into the barrel more than 125. Okay? When you put it in the bottle, the minimum that you can put in the bottle. So you cannot, if it could be called bourbon, you can't go in and buy bourbon light. Okay? I mean, there is no such thing, right? Because you can't be called bourbon. It has to be at least 80 proof or 40% alcohol to be sold. Okay? So if it went into the barrel, let's say it went into the barrel at 110, 120, and you're going to bottle it at 80, you're going to put mineral water with it to water it down. That's basically what they do. You just water it down. Now, you can water it down before it goes in the barrel if you want to, or just do it. It really doesn't make any difference. One way you're going to get one, one or the other. Okay. And lastly, uh, bourbon cannot have any artificial coloring added to it. That is not technically true, although you're going to, hang on just a second, you're going to read books that will tell you that is a fact. I've got a book at home that's written by a lawyer. He's a, he's a bourbon lawyer is really what he is. And he said, that's not really true, but it's gotten to the point to where the federal agents believe it's true, and so nobody's fighting it can't put caramel coloring, which is a tasteless thing, in to make it brown. If it's, uh, if, if it's for chocolate. Where does the name come from? Uh, it comes from, well, okay. There were the Bourbon Kings in France, okay, which is where Bourbon County, Kentucky, was named after the guys from France, okay? So the distilling industry in Kentucky kind of it started around Bourbon County. It's called for Bourbon. That's where the name came from. And by the way, okay. You, you teed me up. Hang on just a second, Andy. You teed me up. Here's the rules for bourbon. Does there anywhere on there say that it has to be made in Kentucky? <laughs> Andy, where do you live? The second biggest producer of bourbon in the United States is Indiana. Yes, okay, uh, I get, okay, so I just put up here, look, I just randomly picked some brands, just so you know what we're talking about bourbon, because there might be some people who don't even want to talk about bourbon, okay? Here's some famous brands of, uh, of bourbon, okay? And you're going to notice that one of the top is Jack Daniels. Where's Jack Daniels made? It's made in Tennessee, okay? You'll notice that Jack Daniels does not say bourbon on the label. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but it's bourbon. It's bourbon, okay? Here are four brands of uh, bourbon that are made here in Indiana. There's bourbon made all over the United States now, okay? And uh, matter of fact, the one I've got back there on the left that you all can notice before you leave is, is Huber's, which is made over by, by Louisville. Uh, Huber Winery now is making, uh, making whiskeys too, and uh, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, it is a fib that people in Kentucky say uh, that it must be from Kentucky to be called bourbon. Oh, that's, that's not true, but it is true that about 90% of the bourbon made in the United States is made. Okay, there are some other terms that I know that you have heard of involving bourbon. Okay, those were the general rules that I just gave you. Now, there are some specific rules if the label says that it's straight bourbon whiskey and if it has a location on it, which most of them do. For example, Jim Beam will say straight Kentucky bourbon. Well, no one means it's got to be from Kentucky. Okay? And to be called straight, then there's some other rules involved. Number one, it must be at least two years in the barrel. Remember, I told you technically to be called bourbon, it just passed through the barrel. Technically speaking, yes, you could label it if it just passes through the barrel, but it's got to be called straight bourbon. It's got to be in the barrel at least two years. 
And then, do not ask me to explain these last two. <laughs> because that's what the rules say, but it really doesn't make any sense. What it says is, if the age is less than four years in the barrel, it must have an age statement on the label. So, if you buy a bottle of whiskey that says straight, straight Kentucky bourbon, and it has no age statement, that means it has to be at least four years old. Okay? If it's more than four years old, no age statement's required. Well, usually, typically speaking, the older it is, the more time in the barrel, you know, you'd think it's, you'd want to put that on the label. But don't ask me to go any further. So those are the, these are typically what you would think of as the rules for bourbon because most bourbon you're buying is straight bourbon. Okay? I mean, I don't know, I'll bet none of you in, in the room has ever bought a bottle of bourbon that's less than two years old. So it's going to say straight Kentucky bourbon. But technically speaking, it doesn't have to be called bourbon. Yes? Oh, so corn fluctuates in price. Does it, does it at all affect the price of bourbon? Absolutely. Absolutely. Corn's eight fifty now. It's eight bucks. It's eight bucks. Uh, a year ago it was probably five bucks. Do you think the distillers are getting squeezed? Absolutely. Like everybody else. They're trying to raise their prices like everybody else. Yes, Dosi. What's the longest the bourbon has ever stayed in the barrel? Uh it, I, we don't know yet because it's still in it. <laughs> <laughs> they they will, they will pull stuff out of what are called rick houses. Rick houses are where they store all the barrels. You know, you go to Kentucky, you guys have been there, you know, these big massive warehouses full of barrels, okay? And, you know, they're taking stuff out all the time, and they're all the time in these big, huge, massive warehouses. There are some barrels that are tucked away in the corner and been sitting there forever and they've gotten lost. And, uh, and then the, the distiller or the, the label, the brand, Diageo or uh, uh, Sazerac or whoever the big company is will say, holy smoke, I think we've got, you know, 50 barrels of 15-year-old bourbon here. We can sell that for a lot of money. So they put 15-year-old bourbon on the label and everybody buys it up because they think it's something premium. And truth be told, especially with bourbon, the older it is, it's not necessarily bad. Because think about it, this is a virgin oak barrel. Nothing else has ever been in it. So it's taken so much of those flavors out of the oak that's kind of like, it's over oaked. I mean, it's, it seems like I'm licking it up. <laughs> so the answer to your question is, the, a better question might be, what is the oldest age statement on a bottle that's ever been sold with bourbon? I can't answer that. Okay, another term I know that you've heard of is called bottled and bond. Go real quickly on this one. Basically means it has to be from a single distiller, distill, I'm sorry, single distillery at a, a single distiller, meaning one company, at a single distillery, one location, because these big, Distilling companies own places everywhere, right? They can't bring one in from the other end of Kentucky and bring it in and mix it with something that they made at this other distillery and call that bottled and bond. That's the reason that label exists. It's because people were doing that in a really, really bad way back in the old days. They were shipping whiskey in from, and labeling it, and, and, and they wanted to say, no, this came from this place, okay? Uh, secondly, it's got to be at least four years old, and it's got to be 100 proof in the bottle, which is kind of because it's going to be kind of hot. Uh, lastly, here's some other stuff that I know you've heard of before, so just to throw it up there. Uh, there are these other categories. Number one, you've heard of rye whiskey before. Rye whiskey basically means that in the mash bill, it's at least 51% rye. Remember, bourbon is 51%. It's got to be at least 51% for a good thing for Okay? In practicality, most bourbon is around 70 to 75% corn. Because it's high yielding, we got a lot of it, it's relatively cheap, yada, yada, yada. Okay? So uh, most of them, and if you're ever interested, you've got a favorite brand of bourbon, I got all the mash bills at home. I can look it up for you and tell you what it is. 
Uh, but rye whiskey, if you buy a bottle of rye, it must be at least 51% in the mash bill is rye. It kind of substitutes corn. Now the rest of it's probably corn. Okay, corn whiskey, and you don't see this very often, but if you buy a bottle of corn whiskey and it says on the label it's corn whiskey, then it's more than 80% corn in the mash bill. Okay, a weeded whiskey, and now this is even getting even fuzzier, but this is kind of whiskey jargon now. If somebody says that's a wheated whiskey, most bourbon is 60 to 70 percent corn, 20% uh, uh, rye, and 10% malted barley. They're almost all those three grains. Okay, malted barley. We're going to talk about malted barley in a second, but it's corn, it's rye, it's malted barley. If somebody wants to take the rye out and substitute wheat for it, that's called a weeded whiskey. For example, Maker's Mark is weeded. Uh, Pappy Van Winkles is a weeded whiskey. There's no rye in it, they substitute wheat. Wheat tends to be a little mellower. Uh, uh, rye is spicy, it gives it the spicy flavor. Uh, and lastly, uh, okay, let's get back to Jack Daniels. Distillers in Tennessee who are making bourbon want you to think it's a branding process and want you to think, yeah, but this is Tennessee whiskey. It's special. Okay? What is that? Well, it's something called the Lincoln County process, and it's traditionally distillers in Tennessee pass their distillate through a charcoal filter before they bottle. That's it. You know, Jack Daniels always makes a big deal of charcoal filters. You know, it's special. If you like it, you like it. Do what? Old number seven. Old number seven, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's on the label. And that's because of the Tennessee process. Most distillers, if you buy whiskey, it's a Tennessee, is using that. Because that's kind of their deal. It, 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 make, it gives them something to market. But it's for. Rod, what's sour mash? Sour mash? Ah. Every bourbon you've ever drank is sour mash whiskey. Okay, what sour mash is, is, okay. Remember that, we were talking about making beer, remember the mash tune, and they talked about, they put it all in there, and then eventually they drain some of that, they drain that off to go distill it, okay. They keep about 20%, and they take it, and they put it in the next batch. The reason they're doing that, that is they want to maintain a consistency of flavor. As, as Tom pointed out, you know, every corn's got different enzymes on it, it's got different bacteria on it, it tastes different. So in order to maintain consistency, they always pull some out and put in the next batch. That's sweet? called sour mash. What about sweet mash? I don't know that term. Indiana, one of the Indiana guys is using that term. It's probably, it's I'll bet it's sour mash, you just call it something else. <laughs> is some people put it on the label like it's a big deal. You know, this is sour mash whiskey. They're all sour mash. All right. Let's talk about scotch. Any other questions about bourbon? Yeah, I have one. So yes. It seems like over the last 10 years, these small distilleries have opened up all over the place. They have. And is, was there a change at all? Or what, what? No. No. It's bourbon got so hot, everybody loved it. It became really cool, and everybody wanted to do it. Kind of like wineries. Kind of like wineries. Yeah, you know, you know, the wine thing kind of came and went, didn't it? I mean, when the last time you heard of a new winery open up? It's kind of saturated. It's like golf courses, you know? It's kind of, well, you know, the market's kind of, we got enough golf courses now. We got enough winery. Nobody's really building new ones. The bourbon thing got hot. You couldn't get enough on the shelf. Everybody was buying it like crazy. And so you had a lot of people like you and me that said, you know what, let's get a bunch of guys together and make a story and, you know, and, and, and remember, they're not going to sell any whiskey out of there for at least two, realistically, four years. So what are they making in the meantime? Vodka and gin. But you could sell that out the door on day one. So they did. That's why we had a billion flavored vodkas all of a sudden. Because everybody's making vodka and they couldn't get rid of it. Because, you know, they were trying to make some money. 
Uh, here and then there, and then we'll go up. If I recall, you said it burned in the barrel. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, can it be another type of tree? For bourbon, by law, it has to be oak. It has to be. Yeah. For practical reason, oak's the only thing you use. Okay? And 90%, 95% of the oak that's used is white oak. It's, it's white oak because it's very, very hard and very, very, uh, and uh, like red oak, it's much more porous. Even whenever you saw it, you look at it, you know, there's more pores in it. And if you make a barrel out of red oak, put whiskey in it, it, it all spills out. That's called the angel shape. Even with a white oak barrel, you're going to lose maybe, if it's four years old, you'll lose 10 to 15% because the vapors go through those pores and, and go out. Okay. So by law, has to be. Now, other people have experimented by using other woods, and it's just not practical because it all spills out. They lose half of what they make if it ages for four five years. People are trying to maple. Have you heard of taking the effort from, from just uh, moonshine and putting in a bottle or a jug with uh, wood chips? And yeah. Put yes. it from a fireplace yep. and alternate it. You, you can do that. You can buy moonshine, which is basically whiskey that has not gone into a barrel. That's why it's clear. That's all moonshine is. That kind of like the other one. Uh, but put it in a bottle, buy wood chips, put in it, you can age it yourself. Uh, yes? So whiskey, if it's in uh, like a sherry barrel, yes? Not uh, bourbon, whiskey. If, 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 if it is not, it's not, it cannot be labeled bourbon. But it can be whiskey, right? Absolutely. Okay, I'm just, if it's in a bar. The definition for whiskey it is it has to pass through a wood vessel. So they, they can, you, and, and boy, don't shy away from it, because there's some really cool stuff going on. People are aging stuff, and uh, uh, port casts, and uh, wine barrels, and you know, really some cool stuff, and it, it tastes great. Uh, but if you're a real purist, and you know, get caught up on a bourbon, man, well, uh, Laura, real quick. Yeah, just, we got to move on. I, I mean, if I can, so I picture a couple of, you know, there are a million breweries in Michigan. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, and how long does it have to age before they can even put it in the glass and somebody else buy it? Uh, they, can, they, can, they can sell it right out of the still if they want to, but they can't call it whiskey until it goes through a wooden vessel. Mm -hmm. And if it goes through the wooden vessel and it's in there a week, they can sell it to you and call it whiskey. It tasted like that. It was about Probably it was. A lot, a lot of the breweries ended up doing that. They're like, well, what the heck? We're half the way home. We're already making the beer. Let's just buy a still and we'll make our own whiskey. That's why you got a billion distilleries all of a sudden. All right, let's go on. All right, so another big category is scotch. Okay? Lynn, I'll tell the story again. I always do. Whenever we got married, uh, my sweet wife knew I liked scotch. And she went and bought a bottle of scotch and she brought it home to me. And she, and, and I get, wow, that's great, thank you, honey. I really appreciate you buying that. And she said, and yeah, it's even from Scotland. <laughs> okay. Oh, if it's Scotch, it's got to be from Scotland, okay? <laughs> but I, I didn't want to break her heart because she was being seen. <laughs> okay. So, Scotch is from Scotland, okay? So, Scotch whiskey is whiskey that's made in Scotland, okay? Bourbon. Has to be made in the U.S., right? Okay. And 75% of the countries in the world respect that and do not allow anybody to put bourbon on the label unless it came from the U.S. Some of the road third world countries, they don't have that. Okay. All right, but scotch has to be from Scotland. It must be made and distilled in Scotland. The grain doesn't necessarily have to be. They can import the grain. So, like the barley doesn't necessarily have to be grown in Scotland, but uh, it has to be made to still there. Uh, it has to be from water, cereal, and yeast only. Those are the only three ingredients. I have time. On the time. Okay. Uh, now, broad category, we're going to narrow down here on scotch too. It cannot be, it has to be distilled less than 190. What was bourbon? 160. Less than 160, right? In Scotland, you can distill it up to 190. 
Must be aged at least three years in barrel. Uh, and it must be aged in less than 105, 185 gallon wooden cast. In other words, you can't put it in a gigantic thing like they do wine. It's got to be a, a real barrel. And lastly, caramel coloring is permitted in, in Scotland. It is flavorless. It does not alter it one, one iota. And if every time you go, if you have your favorite brand of scotch and it looks this amber color, you want it to look like that every time, the only way they can do that is with caramel coloring because if they don't, uh, it, it all comes from the wood. That color comes from the wood. Linda. What, what do they mean by cereal? Cereal, a grain. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. A I grain. Thought it would be a grain. Has to be made. Now, hang on. Oh. Hang on, hang on, hang on. We're getting there. Okay. This is for to be labeled as Scotch whiskey. Okay? It's got to be made from grain. Now, Let's get to a subcategory, which is the one that really matters, and that is, what is single malt scotch? It, the ones I have in the back are single malt scotches. These are distilleries that are making what's called single malt scotch. The rules for single malt scotch are they have to be made from 100% malted barley. I'm going to talk about what malted barley is in just a second. But it has to be from 100% malted barley. Okay? Must be aged and bottled in Scotland. Okay? The bigger category of Scotch whiskey, you can make it in Scotland, ship in the United States in a big tanker vessel, and then bottle it in the US. But if it's going to have single malt on the label, it's got to be bottled in Scotland. Okay? Must be distilled a minimum of two times in a pot still. They do not allow those big column stills and that industrial method. By the way, every bourbon distillery and what well, not every bourbon All the big guys are all in those big column stills. They are making millions and millions and millions of gallons a day. And if you visit one, you go on the bourbon trail and you visit a bourbon distillery, they don't like to talk about their still. Because if you start asking how tall is that thing? You ever turn that thing off, clean it out? Yeah, I don't like to talk about your stuff. Uh, in Scotland, they love to talk about their still because they're all shaped a certain way. And well, this makes our you know spirit a different character because this. Ours are extremely tall. The taller these pot stills are, the lighter the spirit that it throws off typically. I Meaning it's not as harsh. It's lighter. I don't mean in color. I mean just it tastes lighter. So big tall skills, if you like it, Glen Morangi has the tallest skills in Scotland. And if you want a starter single malt scotch, good place to start, because it's going to be a little light. Okay. Uh, and must come from a single distillery. That's typically the rules. Is that where you would jump into? Because that's typically the rules that we think of for scotch. Okay, because we're really talking about single malt scotch. All right. One of those rules was it must be 100% malted barley. Let's talk about what malted barley is. Okay, number one, we can start with barley, right? Typically in Scotland, they're growing two-row barley. That's a picture of it. There's two rows, there's a stem, and there's barley coming off both sides. It's two rows. A lot of times in the United States, we grow six-row barley. Doesn't necessarily make any difference, I don't think, in the taste, but in Scotland, typically it's two-row barley. That's just a factoid that you don't need to know. Okay. These are the different regions in Scotland. Typically, scotch is sold, it's not sold by, but people might say, I really like Speyside whiskeys. They tend to have their own character. Or I like Highland whiskeys, or I like the islands. This is the island called Islay, I-S-L-A-Y. They have their own distinctive uh, kind of scotch that they make. Uh, and those different areas uh, make different flavored whiskeys. The reason that it's different flavored, remember the grain's all the same. It's 100 percent malted barley. Well what is malting? Malting is basic, and this is the same for the malto meal in your bowl at home or your malted milk bowl. Okay? What malting is, you take a grain, you soak it in water, you let it set until it just begins to sprout. As soon as it begins to sprout, you want to stop the process. 
so you dry it down. You dry it down very quickly. There's a chemical reaction that happens in the seed. It, react, it makes all kinds of, it's like it's a different thing because that thing is germinated now and it changes all the enzymes and everything in the grain. That's a big deal, okay? Because those enzymes in that malted barley make the, the, the fermentation process work really well. That's why almost every whiskey has got some malted barley in it because it really speeds up the fermentation process when it comes out. For single malt scotch, my law, it has to be 100% malted barley. Okay, the question then is, by these different regions, traditionally, how did they dry it down? So they soak it, it sprouts, we gotta stop it because it's already sprouted. Typically what happens today is, is they run it through grain dryers with natural gas and they dry it down. Just like you hear guys grinding their corn around here whenever it comes out of the field and you hear the grain dryers run. Okay, it's typically what they do over there. However, Traditionally, in the western half of Scotland, they were really poor guys back then, okay? And they weren't developed, they didn't have electricity yet, okay? Let alone natural gas. So they had to have another fuel source to dry it down. That fuel source was peat. You ever bought a bag of peat moss? That's what we're talking about, okay? They dig it out of the ground over there. It's really interesting. I mean, this stuff's 20 feet thick in the ground. And they have these special tools and they go down and they pull it out by hand. And it's thick, okay? <coughs> and when you burn it, it smells amazing. To get a brick of that and to put it on a campfire, it smells amazing, okay? Traditionally, that was the only fuel they had. So whenever they were taking all of this grain and they were trying to dry it down, they use these peat fires underneath, and all that smoke from that peat would go up through uh, those grains. That's what gives certain kinds of whiskey a real peated taste, okay? The flavor profiles that whiskey tasting will use are tar, cough drops, uh, me medicinal, I mean, it's real strong, and before you leave, go back and take a sniff of that peated scotch back there. You'll smell it. Smell like cough drops. Okay? And, but it's real unique. So typically, single malt scotch that comes from this side of the country is very, very peated. If you hate scotch because the first scotch you ever had was a real peated scotch, you haven't tried enough scotch. Because most, 90% of them are not. Okay, but depending on the style you want, you may want a little bit of peatiness, but not too much. Or you may want a lot, or you may want somewhere in the middle. That, that depends on you. Okay, so that's single malt scotch. There are a couple other categories of scotch we need to talk about. Number one, that's blended scotch whiskey. Okay. If you're buying Johnny Walker, Ballantines, J&B, Dewars, these are all brands that I know that you've seen on the shelf all the time. They are a blend, okay? They're not a single malt. Remember, a single malt has to be from a single distillery, has to be 100% malted barley, and yada, 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 okay? If it's a blend, the blenders will go buy single malts from all over the country. They might buy 50 different single malts from other companies, put them in their warehouse, and then when they're ready to create their blend, they blend them all together in their own little way that they want to do it to come up with their blend. It's an art. I mean a real art. 90% of the single malt production in Scotland, believe it or not, because in the U.S., all we want to do is buy single malt whiskey, okay? 90% of the single malt goes into blends. We're buying 10% of the production, okay? Uh, so if, if you go, a uh, normal guy in Scotland, if he goes into a bar, he's drinking a blend. So that's blended whiskey. Ah, single grain whiskey, now I'm gonna get back to your point, okay? A blend is made up of A single grain whiskey and 
single or single bonds. Okay. Usually, there's about 50% that is just pure grain alcohol. Okay. It may be made from corn. Remember, we talked about neutral grain spirit, kind of like vodka. Okay, except for the rule of going to 95%. You know, there's guys that are just making alcohol kind of like our ethanol plant, okay? And they're selling it to these blenders. They'll start 50% with just that stuff. Why? Because it's flavorless, okay? And then they mix these single malts to it to make what they want for their blend. So there's the reason why the rule doesn't say that it has to all be uh, malted barley. It's because, well, you can make it out of other grains. And if you're in Scotland, you can buy it, but you're not going to find that over here. I thought it had to be charred. I thought it had to be charred with it too. They use charred barrels. Oh, by the way, okay. Where do you think all the bourbon barrels go? We are using millions, millions of, uh, of bourbon barrels, right? Think of all the bourbon we make in the United States. They can only use it one time. Because it has to be a virgin oak barrel. They ship them to Scotland. Mm -hmm. Scotland says, that's fine with me. I'll put my whiskey in it. Because it's got a lot of life left in it. There's still tannins. There's still stuff. And typically, scotch is aged longer anyhow. Mm -hmm. If you're buying a single malt scotch, it's usually 10 to 12 years old. So it's got plenty of time. And they'll use those barrels like three times. Before they retire, a barrel in Scotland is probably 80 years old. Mm -hmm. 50, 60. Okay, Irish whiskey. We've all had Irish whiskey, right? Okay. Uh, some people say that the Irish invented distilling. Uh, the Chinese will argue with them about that, uh, but uh, the art of distilling a fermented liquid and making it distilled spring may have started in Ireland. Here are the rules that make Irish whiskey a little bit unique, okay? Fact of the matter is, Irish whiskey went for a very long time with no rules. Very long time with no rules. But here's what basically what they're made up of today. I'm sorry. Um, here we go. Mash bill has to contain some malt of barley. Like single malt scotch has to be 100%, right? Okay, in Ireland, if you're gonna sell an Irish whiskey, it has to have some malt of barley in it, but it does not define a percentage. Okay, uh, again, it's gotta be less than 189.6, and it's gotta be aged three years. Not a whole lot of rules involved there, right? Traditionally, here are the rules of Irish whiskey. Traditionally, they got a lot of unmalted barley in them. In other words, their mash bill is made up of a lot of unmalted barley. Now, they're using a lot of barley because that's what they grow over there. They're not growing corn over there. They're growing, now, they could import it, uh, but they're using a lot of unmalted barley. The reason for that was Ireland put a tax on Scottish imported malted barley. And so they got cheap and said, well, let's just make it out of barley. So they did. Uh, secondly, traditionally, they triple distilled. Remember in Scotland, it's got to be twice. In Ireland, traditionally, it's triple distilled in pot stills. Okay, traditional. These are not rules; they're traditional. I, it's hard to find a real distinctiveness about Irish whiskey's flavor. I mean, you could you could have a bourbon, you could have Scotch, you go, wow, those are really different. And then you can have a glass of Irish uh, whiskey and go. Not quite sure what I got here. Because they sell a lot of single malt Irish whiskey. So there really are kind of anything goes, but there are some traditional rules. So if it's an old fashioned Irish whiskey, it's probably triple distilled and got a whole lot of unmalted barley. All right, Canadian, here's the rules. These are a lot like scotch. I know you've all had Canadian whiskey. Here's some Crown Royal, Canadian Mist, Canadian Club. You've heard of this whiskey before. They're almost all blends. Uh, there's, you know, they're all blending stuff together to make their whiskey. Uh, there's the rules with one exception, and this one is really important. Are you ready for this one? You can add 9.09% .09 of other things into it and still call it Canadian whiskey. 
Don't ask me how they got the O9. <laughs> Oftentimes that will be port, sherry, just regular wine. So when you buy a Canadian whiskey, uh, you're, the one I have back there, which is Canadian this, that's a cheap bottle of Canadian whiskey. I think I bought that out of the store for nine bucks or something. Okay? I had a glass of it the other night, and I thought, you know what, that tastes good. But I could tell it had wine or something in it because it was real mellow and almost fruitiness to it. It was no harshness like a regular whiskey. So if you've never had whiskey before, try a Canadian whiskey because it's probably mellowed out with some wine or some port or something like that. Now, real whiskey snobs get all upset about that and go, well, you know, why would I want to drink Canadian whiskey? You know, that's a bunch of crap they're putting in there. As far as I'm concerned, it tastes good. You like it. If you like it, you like it. Who cares? All right. Uh, Japanese. This is, here's your bonus category. Okay? This is not a category that you... If I said we were going to talk about the four major uh, whiskeys made around the world, and I said, you know, like Scotch and bourbon and the Canadian and Irish, you go, yeah, I've yeah, heard all those. Okay. Japanese whiskey is traditionally not one of those. But if you're in the whiskey world and you like whiskey, this has became a category of their own. Uh, there's a reason for that. I used to work for a Japanese company. I'm going to tell you, they are fanatics about everything. <laughs> to their detriment, as we know, right? Okay, but let me leave that aside. They are fanatical about the quality of their whiskey. I mean, they're nuts about it. They are really tuned in on it. And because of that, people started discovering and saying, this is really good stuff. And everybody started buying it. And people were buying it as an investment. They were buying everything they could get their hands on, let it set for 10 years because nobody could get their hands on it anymore. It became a real phenomenon in the whiskey world. Because of that, the whiskey distillers in, in Japan tried to fill the void because they got a hot market here. We can Put Japan on it and everybody will buy it. Okay, so it became a really big deal. It's sort of a category on its own. Okay, there are no rules. Just about anything goes, but they love scotch. And when I travel over there, trust me, they love scotch. And they learned their craft from making single malts. So typically, if you're going to buy a real nice high-end bottle of Japanese whiskey, it's probably going to be a single malt. Okay. Uh, one thing that makes it a little unique is they have their own kind of oak over there, which is called Mizunara oak, and uh, it's a Japanese oak uh, variety, and uh, it does give a unique flavor. The problem is that oak's really expensive, and so if you got something that's aged in uh, Mizunara oak, it's, it's going to cost you some money. Okay. That bottle that I have back there, uh, that was, uh, I got lucky finding that. I found it in New York. It was like $125. Okay, so you're not going <laughs> to that home. But uh, it is a little bit uh, unique. Okay, then there's, this, this lecture is about whiskey from around the world. We've talked about these five categories. Look, there's whiskey made all around the world. I just ripped this off the internet. This is distilleries all around the world. It can be fun to find some and just try them, okay? It's hard to talk about any distinct character they might have as a category or a country because there are probably no rules. You know, just do whatever you want, which is fun because sometimes it's fun when you don't get constrained by the rules. Kentucky bourbon guys get a little constrained by the rules. They can't get creative. You know, now they're starting to make some stuff like Fireball, you know, which is like the second biggest whiskey brand in America. Okay, and because they put red hot flavor in it, but it can't be called bourbon because of that. Okay, so the you know the rules sometimes can get a little constraining. So if you buy some whiskey from around the world, you know there are no rules, and uh, you know you try. Oh, wow, I don't know what they're making this out of, but it's pretty good. Uh, I have some back there on the table on the back. Uh, I have a bottle that's from Taiwan, I have one from Austria, one from India, and one from Wales. Uh, I saw one at Total Wine and more the other day that was from Mexico. 
And I kind of kicked myself for not buying it. Just bad around. Just bragging. But anyhow, there's whiskeys all around the world. And uh, okay, to wrap this up, I apologize. I couldn't have played my crowd if it was they were still with me. I would invite you to do this because we cannot taste here tonight. Uh, a lot of your taste comes from smell. Okay, so if you go back, I have uh, six different whiskeys back there. In particular, there's an unpeated scotch and then there's a peated scotch. If you take the, what do you call those? The canter thing? If you take that off, stick it in your nose, get a good whiff of it, that's going to tell you a lot what it would smell or taste like. So if you wonder, well, what's the difference between bourbon and scotch? Do the bourbon, smell it. You're probably going to smell a lot of oak. It's going to smell like an oak tree. Why? It's in a virgin oak barrel, right? Uh, you smell the scotch, it'll, it'll smell differently. So uh, in lieu of, uh, of uh, drinking tonight, you can uh, just take a sniff and uh, <laughs> see the different kinds. Uh, lastly, hang on a second, shameless advertising. Um, I do have a business where I do whiskey tastings. So, uh, a, lot, a lot like this. Kentucky are painted or black? They're dark. Some are. Oh. A lot of times on the inside they turn black <laughs> because there's a vapor that the alcohol puts off that goes through the pores of the wood and there's a, a particular mold that I mean, runs. Why are they not painted white in Kentucky when they are painted white? I, I can't answer that question. I don't, ask them to do the there's, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that all of them in Scotland are painted. I, I mean, I've seen some that are painted white, but I don't think they all are. Anybody got any other questions? Yes. After you've opened your bottle of whiskey, how long will it last? Uh, it will last. It will last a really long time. It's not like a bottle of wine because it's alcohol. Alcohol is a preservative. I mean, you take a cucumber and put it in a bottle and pour alcohol in it, and it'll last forever, right? Because it's preserved. So the, the answer is uh, the, it will last forever as long as your cork is kind of tight and you're keeping the air out of it. Uh, but it's not like wine. It'll last forever. So if, And it does not age in the bottle. I mean, that's, we're talking about the wood, not the bottle. So if you, like your father-in-law is dying or something and you're inheriting a bottle that's 90 years old, it's a big deal.
Thank you so much for being here tonight. Come see us again.